Good morning. I'm not going to be all fake cheery and everything. You all know better than that. I'd be lying to you. <laughs> I did miss that hour. But we are delighted to be here with you. I'm Wayne Young. I'm a member of the board here at Northside, and uh, we're delighted you're worshiping with us today. Whether you're in person, whether you're online, uh, we come together because uh, we have an awesome God who is worthy of our worship. And uh, we are together like this and lift him up and praise him and then live for him every day out in the community. And uh, we're glad that you're part of that Northside family as we strive to do that each and every day. And uh, again, whether you're with us in person or online, we, we consider you part of our family and we hope you're with us every time we gather. If you're new, it's the first time or recent, a uh, welcome, a uh, special welcome to you. We're delighted that uh, you're with us. There's a lot of exciting things going on here in our church and uh, we just can't wait for the blessings God has in store. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that we can come together. We're so thankful that some of the obstacles that, that have kept us from gathering uh, are being removed. And we know that's going to take a while. We know it still won't be the same. But we know that when we come together in your name, that you will bless it and that you will build it up and that things will flow from it that will glorify your name here in this place and in this community, and we just look so forward to being a part of that uh, as we move forward as the body of Christ. We thank you for this day and the chance to be here. Uh, we pray that each person who is participating in this worship will be lifted up, will be built up in your service so that we can go out from this place and carry your name everywhere we go and glorify and honor you in everything we do. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
the anguish of the grave came over me, and I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. And when I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, O soul, for the Lord has been good to you.
So um, a year ago, last weekend, um, I took uh, Sabrina and the kids to, uh, we went out of town and we, uh, we went to a college basketball game. And, uh, you know, 15,000 people screaming our heads off. Uh, we, had, we had driven there and, you know, thinking about the, the pandemic, I mean, it was, it was in our minds go in a, a restaurant and, and think, well, you know, is the virus here? And, but living pretty normally. I mean, we went to a couple restaurants and, you know, we, we did our thing and we came back. And of course, a year ago this weekend, um, you know, the NBA canceled their season, college basketball, there were people, you know, gathering on the court, getting ready to play and they decided not to do it. And we were, you know, really in the pandemic at, at that point. And so, from there, you went from gathering in these huge venues with 15,000, 20,000, 25,000 people to, um, you know, we're, we're in our homes uh, locked down. And I mean, it was a scary uh, time. Um, but I will say that there were some benefits uh, to the lockdowns in terms of, you know, our lives are so busy and we're doing so much stuff all the time uh, with our kids, with church, and we got a chance to kind of take a breath. And of course, we went online with uh, with church, and I mean, I you know there were things about that that I could get used to, and we stayed. Um, and we, last weekend was our first weekend back as a, as a family, but you know you're sitting there. And we were joking last week. You know, I, I thought I, I said I'll bring the laundry to church and I'll just you know fold laundry while Nick is is preaching. Nick, can you hang on just a minute? I got to go get my stuff out of the dryer. Um, let me go get a cracker, a, a graham cracker, or whatever for, uh, for communion. Um, you know, we had similar experiences at work um, and, and with our kids. So at work, you know, we have company meetings, and we had to figure out how to maintain that connection um, with the staff without being able to do that. Um, grants and scouts, and we did have some, we, we didn't meet for a long time. And, uh, you know, so again, benefits in that you got more family time, but you lose that, uh, that connection. And, you know, I, I, I think I'm really happy to be back. I'm, I'm glad that more people are back. I know I've seen some people who, um, you know, you see on Facebook Live, they were here the whole time after we opened, but then a lot of families that are just now coming back. And I think that, you know, one of the things that you lose is that connection to the body because um, this is the body of Christ here, uh, us, all of us together. It's not just, um, you know, when I think about the body of Christ, that's what I think about. So from Matthew, uh, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, say, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the, uh, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I will tell you, I will not drink from this, uh, from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And, and so, you know, I, I, think, I think we should all think about, you know, kind of lo what we lost during the pandemic. Obviously, people sick, half a million lives lost, but I think we lost that ability to connect and, and be together. So, you know, as we, as we take the, uh, the, the bread and the juice today, I just want you to think about that and think about the body of Christ as being all of us together. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us all together here. And, um, you know, those of us who are online and those of us who are together, and Lord, help us to feel that connection with each other, whether we're here in person or, um, you know, out on Facebook. Uh, we're, we are one body. Uh, so, Lord, we ask that you forgive us for our, for our sins. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Appreciate Rob's meditation, Wayne's welcome, appreciate the worship team doing a phenomenal job and things today. And I'm sure that those of you joining us online have never had to put Nick on pause, right? I mean, who would want to do that? Uh, <laughs> no, I really thought that was, that was, uh, that was funny. Um, it's good to be together and, uh, and to be able to enjoy this time of worship here today. About a week ago, I came across uh, an amazing story in the news. There was a man who had just arrived on a flight at, the, at an airport in New Jersey, and he had gone to the baggage claim. That man was about 60 years old, and he'd gone to the baggage claim to get his baggage, and while he was standing there, he fell down, uh, hit his head, and when people approached him afterward, they could tell he was significantly injured. I mean, he was uh, in uh, uh, foaming at the mouth, having a seizure, things like that. Something very significant had happened. And so they immediately call to uh, an officer, someone to come respond. And a sort of a Port Authority officer comes and responds, begins administering CPR, and uh, then calling for backup as well, calling for other people to come and other officers to help him. Right about the time that all this is beginning to unfold, there's another flight from Florida that has just started to let off its passengers, and so they're making their way to the baggage claim. And among those who are making their way to the baggage claim is a, a cardiac surgeon who is uh, there. He's just returning back home from a trip to Florida with his family, and he notices, his family notices what's going on, and immediately he jumps into action to go over and, and start helping this officer who's administering CPR and uh, trying to help this man out. He was in a bad, bad way. Finally, other officers get there. I'm sure it seemed like forever, but at the same time, probably was just more like seconds when all this is transpiring. And these officers come, and they arrive, and they begin administering the defibrillator a few times. And finally, the man starts breathing again, and, uh, and he's taken off to the hospital. And actually, the last I had heard in the news, uh, this man was actually uh, you know, really on the way to recovery. There was no complications that were anticipated there. A really powerful story. It's powerful just when you listen to it and you say, wow, here's a guy, it's a life or death situation. You can feel life hanging in the balance. You see the heroic actions of these people who were present. And all of that alone makes it a compelling story. What adds just a little bit more interest to it, though, as well, is the fact that the, the cardiac surgeon who had gotten off the plane from Florida was none other than Dr. Oz. It was literally Dr. Oz who had gone and was helping this man, helping these officers. And the first officer to arrive on the scene didn't even realize who it was because, of course, you know, masks are required in the airport. It was only a little bit later that he looks up and he realized that the guy help, that's helping him is, in fact, Dr. Oz. And he said, and when he was interviewed by ABC News, he says, you know what, you really can't get better help than that. What's really cool, and this happens all the time, and not just in that situation, but it happens with doctors and, and you know, nurses and, and first responders and things. Here, you know, something else may be going on in life, and something happens, a life or death situation, and immediately they see the need, they jump into action, they go and do. Today, a man is alive because other people allowed their own hearts to be. They allowed their own hearts to be made alive with compassion for the need of somebody else. Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon share the story of a mutual friend that uh, had a neighbor whose house was run down. And the friend describes it this way. He says the garage door was falling off the hinges. There were two dead cars sitting out front. And so what the neighbor said that he did is he decided he was going to call code enforcement because something needed to be done about this house, right? I mean, it's like kind of looking out his window as that kind of neighbor saying, yeah, well, we got to make sure everyone's kind of toeing the line here. And so he says, I'm going to call it code enforcement. He calls code enforcement. Code enforcement comes out. They ticket the house. A few days later, however, the same man is talking to another neighbor about the blighted house when that neighbor tells him, yeah, I guess the woman who lives in that home lives alone and her mother has cancer. She had to stop working to care for her mom. She's been by her mom's bedside for 24 hours a day for the past few months. And when he heard that story, when all of a sudden this neighbor became human once again to him, all of a sudden the switch flipped and compassion and conviction came upon him and he, he learned that this woman's story and, so, and that she was spending every waking moment caring for that sick mother and so he decided to do something at that moment. He rallied a few other neighbors and they fixed the woman's garage door, they hung up her gutters, they helped fix her cars and more importantly, they got to know her name and they got to know more of her story and in all these ways, 
became a way of communicating to her she was not alone and that there were people around her who did, in fact, care. But simply knowing her story made all the difference. Simply knowing the story. Are we in a place to know the stories of the people around us, to be led to that conviction, to be led and, and maybe for doors to be open where we can meet people in their moment of need and share the love of God with them? That's the question I want us to be considering today. Earlier this week, I was made aware of and I was reminded of a number of prayer needs uh, that exist sort of in the circles of, of people around me. And frankly, i got to be honest with you, I've been overwhelmed by a lot of the prayer needs <laughs> that exist around me, and, and perhaps you've reached moments uh, in your life like that as well. Uh, it's neighbors, or maybe it's family and friends, and you know what happens nowadays, a lot of the way we communicate these things, right, is we get onto a, a Facebook Messenger list, a massive list, or a massive text list, and, and people are just looking for prayer wherever they can get it because they're in a really critical situation. But on the other end, sometimes you're part of a group of 20 people, and there's, a, and there's constant messages coming and going and stuff, and it's really hard to, to, to keep up with. Matter of fact, I think even more so now for this time in life right now, you know, we see a lot of things happening where we see, uh, you know, the warm weather's coming back and vaccines are out. And so everybody's kind of getting out more and we're kind of doing more. And, and so life all of a sudden is kind of starting to pick back up again, uh, kind of going along with some of the things Rob was saying here just a minute ago that we've experienced in this time frame. And so now life's picking back up again. And now it, maybe we're starting to approach this challenge of, you know, how do we stop and make room for other people in our life? How do we allow ourselves to stop and feel compassion and conviction? I'm not going to claim that my prayer life's amazing right now because it isn't. Frankly, I, I've kind of hit a patch here of inconsistency and really need to reestablish my prayer life. But I can tell you this, that one of the best things that I've done in the entire last week was to turn the car radio off uh, in my car on Friday. I had a 30-minute drive back home from Lexington. I'd gone to a chiropractor appointment. I turned the radio off, and for 30 minutes, I had a conversation with God, an honest conversation with God, and one where I specifically mentioned the names of people who were on my heart. There's not a lot of things I can do for a lot of the needs that exist around me. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a miracle healer. But for 30 minutes on a Friday, I was able to do something. I was able to take two resources I had. I had time and I had prayer. And I believe God heard those things. And I believe that it does make a difference. Last week, we talked about our need for Jesus to truly have our heart. And we're talking about evangelism. We're talking about, you know, going and sharing the gospel and being the hands and feet of Christ to the world around us. We talked about it, the very, the very foundation of that, you know, God has to have our heart. He needs to consume our heart for us to be most effective and to be most faithful in, in carrying out what God has called us to do. That's the starting point. Scotty Smith, we shared this quote at the end of last week's message. Scotty Smith, minister in Franklin, Tennessee, said, Jesus is more zealous for our love than he is zealous for our works. Because if he has our hearts, he'll have everything else. I mean, we talked about last week how if, if, if Jesus truly consumes our hearts, we'll run through brick walls and we'll hang on crosses for him. And that's exactly what happened to Peter, right? At the end of his life, Peter did hang on a cross. So our roots need to be very deep in Christ and, and deeply beholden to him and consumed by him. So we think about that, right? We're running through brick walls and hanging on crosses. But you know the reality is for most of us today? For most of us today, Jesus isn't asking for brick walls and literal crosses. Sometimes we may feel that they are brick walls. And sometimes we may feel that he's asking us to, to take up that cross. And of course, there is a sense in which Jesus did ask us to take up our crosses every day. But sometimes when we look back, we're not being asked to hang on a cross, most of us here. We're not being asked to do that, literally. Matter of fact, the most Jesus just is asking most of us each and every day is simply to respond by being good neighbors to the people around us. And maybe sometimes that does feel like having to run through a brick wall. But hopefully today we can kind of put it in a little bit of perspective as to what really is being asked. And really, it's not much further from what Jesus has done for us and the blessings we've received from him. I want you to turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. We're going to be looking at a very familiar story here in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 10, 25. And here's what it says. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, and the him here is Jesus, to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus did, he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a story, as Jesus often does, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back, or when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Let's talk about this passage for a minute. It's parable of the Good Samaritan. And we've heard this perhaps many times, but let's talk about it. Some things that are really going to help, that really do help this story kind of come alive to us. The first thing is this. When we look at this passage, notice that there are no exceptions to neighbors. There are no exceptions to who qualifies under the, under the category of a neighbor. There's a very particular, um, there's a very particular teaching in an ancient book of Jewish wisdom that would have been very familiar to the people of Jesus' time when he's giving this story. There's this ancient uh, book of Jewish wisdom called the book of Sirach. It's sort of like, think of it like a commentary on the Bible, a commentary uh, to godly living, even though in this particular case it's very much off of, of the, uh, the idea that God wants us to have. In this book, this familiar book of Jewish wisdom, Sirach chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, the readers are actually told not to help a sinner. That if you fall in the category of a sinner, that person is not to be helped. So knowing that gives us a little bit more background into what this man, is, this Jewish lawyer is asking. And when we say he's a Jewish lawyer, what it means is he is an expert in Jewish tradition. So he knows the book of Sirach. He knows the teachings there. And what he's asking Jesus to do when he asks this question, who is my neighbor? What he wants to do is he wants Jesus to make a distinction. He wants Jesus to draw a line, to say, okay, God, Jesus, if you would identify who the sinners are and who they're not so that I can help the people who aren't. And what he thinks in his own mind, really, is that the people who are God's people are the ones who qualify as neighbors. The people who follow God, the people who are already part of the Jewish community, they're the ones who are qualify as neighbors. Anybody else doesn't. And, of course, Jesus makes no such distinction. And that's one of the great things that he teaches in this passage. But before we get much more into that, I want to talk about another fact that's very important to helping us see the gravity of what's happened in this story that Jesus tells. The second point is this, that the road from Jericho to Jerusalem is notoriously treacherous. It's notoriously treacherous. It's well known in Jesus' day how treacherous it was. It's a 17-mile journey between these two cities, and it's, and it's, a, it's a, a journey that is full of peril. It's full of danger. According to Daryl Bach in his commentary on the, on the Gospel of Luke, what thieves would do, there were thieves who would take advantage of the caves that lined this road as it wound through the desert, and they would jump out, and they would uh, jump the travelers as they passed through. And everybody in Jesus' time knows this. They know this truth about this road. So when Jesus speaks of a man being left half dead on the side of the road, he's talking about a man in the reader's mind or in the listener's mind. Here's, they're thinking of this 17-mile stretch of road that they themselves know is treacherous. And here's a guy in the middle of the desert left for half dead. He's got no friendly faces in sight. The people who walk this road know how dangerous it is. And so when they see a man in this man's condition, they know he's in trouble. They know he's in trouble. They know he's in need. It would be hard for anyone to pass by and say that he wasn't. Thirdly, neighbors may come in surprising places. Neighbors may come in surprising places. This is sort of the flip side of the coin we were talking about earlier. According to Aaron Chambers, 
the Jews hated the Samaritans, and that's something we see a lot in Scripture in the New Testament. We, we hear a lot about that relationship. In 721 B.C., here's what happens. King Sargon of Assyria comes in, and he invades and destroys Samaria, basically the northern kingdom of Israel. He comes and destroys it. He carries away all but a remnant of the Jewish population that remains there. Uh, and he leaves the, the, a, a remnant, as I said. He leaves a remnant of those Jews. Other, all the other ones he takes off in captivity. The ones who remain end up intermarrying with the Assyrians, who then took possession of the land, and they created a mixed race uh, of the two cultures. And the Jews, the, those who were the most orthodox, considered these people to be unclean, which is one of the sad things about this relationship. They considered them to be unclean. So when you think of the Good Samaritan, and you're trying to put yourself in the context of what Jesus' listeners are thinking at this moment as he's sharing the story, think of somebody as the Samaritan as someone who is viewed as less than human by pretty much everybody around them. It's a sad, sad situation. As Daryl Bach states, the idea of a Good Samaritan was an oxymoron to a Jew at that time. Yet the irony in the story is obvious. We are disappointed the most in this story by the two people that should have had the spiritual resources, the greatest spiritual resources to be able to be convicted by God about the condition of the man on the side of the road. The priest who passes by is essentially the Jewish equivalent of a pastor or preacher. The, the, the Levite who passes by on the other side of the road is a, essentially the, the equivalent of what we would call today a deacon in the church, a person who assists in the ministry of, of, of the fellowship. We don't know their motivations. Jesus doesn't spend time going into what their motivations were, why they avoided, but they avoided. They made for sure that they were going to ignore the man at the side of the road. They did so much that they even walked literally to the other side of the road as if to even maybe lie to themselves as though they didn't see him. Like he wasn't there. And that backdrop makes the Samaritan's actions all the more powerful. Because the victim, it's interesting, the victim himself, because he's traveling, it says in Jesus' story, from Jerusalem to Jericho, what it seems to indicate to us is that the man himself, who's the victim, is actually Jewish. So here we have all these men in the story who were Jewish, and the one who is the hero, the one who is the only person to stop and help the man, was the only person in the story who wasn't. And he pours out every resource at his disposal to meet the desperate need that lay there at the side of the road in a heap of flesh in front of him. Neighbors come in some unexpected places. And perhaps we're the person, maybe the people in our lives wouldn't expect us to be the neighbor, the way we talk about maybe others or treat people and things. Maybe because of a change God might be putting on our heart today, we might be that unexpected neighbor now to others I know of a lot of people who found God in unexpected places, people who found greater faith and love at an AA meeting than they ever found at the church. And we, sometimes we act with shock about that, and it should sadden us. But at the same time, after reading this story, can we really say it surprises us? God does these kinds of things. Here's the point for us today. Let us not become guilty of having the resources for mercy than failing to use them. Let us not become guilty of having the resources for mercy than failing to use them. That can be spiritual resources, knowing what God has done for us. That can be physical resources, whatever it may be. But let us not be like those other two who had the resources for mercy and failed to use them. We think in this series we're talking about good trees in the context of evangelism and being a mighty forest that provides respite and healing for people in the midst of a, uh, of a world that is scorched by sin and suffering. When we think about a tree, uh, the people who get to experience the shade of a tree are those who are within reach of its branches. And, and whoever is within reach of the branches, the, the tree doesn't discriminate. You know, it gives shade to who is under its branches. That's the rule of the tree. That's what the tree does. I wonder, what type of shade do we provide what type of shade do we provide? Or do we throw another type of shade <laughs> on people around us? How good is the shade we provide to those within reach of our branches? In Luke chapter 8, verse 21, Jesus said this. He said, he answered them. Some people had come to him and said, hey, Jesus, your mother and brothers are here. And here's what Jesus said in response. He takes the opportunity to make a point. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Who those who hear the word, who hear that conviction, allow it to speak to them, and then do something about it. 
And he emphasizes that both in that scripture and in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the importance of being responsive to God. How responsive are we being to the call of God today? Are we being responsive neighbors to the needs around us? If we're going to be responsive, that starts with, I'm going to go through just a list real quick here of three brief statements, one word statements, uh, to helping us kind of follow in obedience here. And if we're going to be responsive neighbors to needs around us, it starts with, first of all, being in a place to see the need. So number one, let's see. Let's have our eyes open. How do we get our eyes open? In 1996, I took my first of four mission trips to Mexico with my youth group when I was growing up there in high school in Indiana. In 2013, I took a mission trip to Ethiopia. I'm not saying these things in any way. This is not a brag. But what I'm sharing this is, is I can tell you this from my experience, and a lot of you who've been to Haiti with our church here, when you've been to Haiti in years past, you probably have the same experience. Whenever I hear Mexico and Ethiopia mentioned in the news, I cannot any longer just see them as lines on a, on a map. I cannot see them as labels on a globe. They are people. They are people that I know, people who, whose homes I have been treated with hospitality people whose culture and lives I've witnessed, I can't remain detached from it anymore. I, I can't, it doesn't allow me, that experience doesn't allow me to be detached. People are now attached to those places in our minds and we'll never look at them the same again. I would say this as an aside, when all this coronavirus business is around us and travel becomes something maybe we can do again, maybe we need to start looking at how we can get back to doing some mission trips and going places. I know a lot of you would love to go back to Haiti and those kind of things and if that's something God is putting on your heart, please let us know that. I know our missions team would love to know about that as, as they think about the future and so on. You can talk to myself or Laura Hurst, who's our mission team leader, about those things. But that's something we really don't want to forsake. But we don't need to wait till the next mission trip opportunity uh, for an opportunity to see needs around us. What if I told you that even here in, 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 our, in our present time, there's an opportunity gift wrap that's ready and, and waiting for us, every, every week for two hours a week, you can sit and you can hear the needs of people in our community and you can be in a prime position to do something to help us meet those needs. The Church Benevolent Cooperative, we have volunteers. We send volunteers every week to go and meet with people that we've referred to the Church Benevolent Cooperative uh, and to help that cooperative with a grouping of churches that have pooled resources together. We have our volunteers come and interview the people that we recommend to the cooperative uh, to assess their need and help interpret, you know, how much, is, how, how best to respond to that need with those resources. And so it's a gift wrap opportunity to serve. If you'd like to serve uh, on a Wednesday morning, it's Wednesday mornings, 10 to, to noon. We need particularly men. We need men because a lot of guys, when we have guys that come in and meet a need, we want to have men present in the room to be able to help with that. And so if you feel uh, led to do so, we would really encourage you to take advantage. Talk to me, talk to Wayne Courier, talk to Linda Sinners. I'd love to connect you. Participate in your homeowners association. Participate in your neighborhood Facebook page. We were able to help uh, here with the bus shortage that we've had in our community recently. Uh, we saw on a, on a neighborhood or on a group community Facebook page, someone said, hey, I need to have help getting my kids to school. And we were able to connect with them and say, hey, you know, we'll help you get your kids to school. And we we're able to help a family to make that happen. We need to be where we can see the needs in the first place. You got to be on the road to Jericho to see the guy lying next to the road. And so it's important for us to open our eyes and be put in positions and places where we can see those needs. Number two, feel. Not only see, but allow, allow your heart to feel. The Casting Crown song, famous song, you've heard it on the radio many times. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break my heart, break our hearts for what breaks yours. In John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept at the passing of Nazareth. Think about the gravity of this for him. Uh, I'm sorry, did I say Nazareth? I think Lazarus is what I meant to say. Uh, Jesus wept at the passing of Lazarus. And think about the gravity of this, even though he's God. Even though he has a view of eternity in both directions, Lazarus mattered to him. And he let himself feel the loss of that moment. He wept at the passing of Lazarus, even though he was God. He got angry when he saw the corruption at the temple, when he saw the market, the money changers and everybody crowding out the space that was set aside for the Gentiles to be able to worship God. God Jesus got angry at that. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, Jesus is in deep anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane over the, the needs of the people for salvation and what he has yet to do to help provide it. 
all of which, all of these are displays of Jesus' humanity, which were fully real, was fully real and fully acceptable to be felt. We don't allow ourselves to feel much anymore. Peter Scazzaro writes this. He says, year after year, we deny and avoid the difficulties and the losses of life, the rejections and the frustrations. People in our churches minimize their failures and disappointments. And the result is that for many today, at least in prosperous North America, there's a widespread inability to face pain. And this has led to an overall feeling of superficiality and a lack of profound compassion. Coming into contact with pain, allowing ourselves to feel it is what helps us feel deeper compassion for other people. It took a tidal wave of prayer requests to break through the wall of self-centeredness in my own life. The act of praying for others also broke the iciness, helped thaw my heart that, that, that were, had been closed off in so many ways to the needs of others around me. It helped refire compassion. You know what? Just deciding, even though we don't feel it, maybe we say, you know, I know I need to do this. We start praying by name for people, and it has a way of thawing us out and putting, making us others focused. Number three, the last thing today, we see, we feel, and then we serve. This is all the response, the response we give to what God puts in front of us and these needs that we see. Because of the limitations of our time, our energy, and our resources, Managing life well, if you think about this, managing life as a mature adult always typically involves more so than decisions between what is good and what is bad. A lot of times we find ourselves having to make decisions between what is good and what is best. And those are some of the hardest decisions we have to make in prioritizing between a lot of good things and the best things. I think it's no coincidence that immediately following the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 is the story of Mary and Martha. Do you remember that story? The story of Mary and her sister Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Mary sits at the feet of Jesus just listening as he's sitting there in the living room of their home while Martha's busy somewhere else being hostess. And she's just worried about just making sure everybody's comfortable and everybody's provided for. And she's busy about all these other things. And she chastises Mary for not helping her. And Jesus responds there in verse 41 and 42. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Author John Ortberg states that love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time, and time is the one thing that hurried people don't have. As, the, as we look around, it's very easy to see all the need that exists around us in the world and to become so overwhelmed by it, right? Right? It's so easy. Man, there is need in every direction we look. We watch the news. There's a need. And it gets so overwhelming that it can paralyze us, actually, to the point where we say, we don't even know what direction to start in, right? I mean, like, who do I help? I've got so many people I can help. Who do I help? Where do I go? How do I do it? We don't know where to begin. As Daryl Bach says, I like this. He says, a better attitude for us is simply to pitch in where one feels a sense and ability to help. Here's the way I would describe that. If we want to know where we can start providing healing shade, restorative uh, expressions of the gospel in somebody else's life, all we got to do is look to see who is within the reach of my branches. That's what God calls us to. That's the only way we can provide shade to this world. If we simply, from where we stand, will attempt to provide shade for the people within the reach of our branches. That's where we begin. So let us not become guilty of having the resources for mercy, but failing to use them today. We have a great opportunity before us to extend shade to a sin-scorched world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the parable of the Good Samaritan, Lord. Lord, what a powerful story. Father, you put so many people in our life. Sometimes maybe there are people we overlook. Sometimes there are people maybe we don't agree with. Sometimes there are people, Lord, uh, that uh, our personalities don't mix. Uh, again, sometimes we just take people for granted. Sometimes it's so easy for us to get wrapped up in our own world. Perhaps those men walked by on that road. They weren't even thinking maybe about this man, at least in entirety. But maybe to them what was important was something that was happening down the road. And they used that to sort of deny the issue that was passing them on the right side of the road. Father, sometimes it's worth it. 
to stop. And may we be people who are constantly attempting to stay in tune with your spirit. Father, may we be constantly intentional about putting ourselves in places to see the needs around us. To allow ourselves to feel compassion for the needs that exist around us. And to serve, to act, to respond to what your spirit compels within us when we see thee and hear these things and feel these things. Father, help us to provide abundant shade for this world that is, again, scorched, by sin and suffering. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you have a decision to make, maybe you feel convicted uh, to, to provide more shade. Maybe you've been provided some shade for, and today you're thankful for that, and you see the source of that is Jesus Christ, and you want to become someone who is also replicating that to others, and you want to give your life to him. We want to encourage you to make that decision today. If you're here in this room, we want to encourage you to sit tight after the service, after everyone is dismissed. You can sit there in your pew. Someone will, uh, one of our leadership will come and uh, talk with you and share with you a little bit and get to know a little bit more about your decision. If you're online with us today, we want to encourage you to just drop a private message to us in Facebook there, or you can email us at office at nschristianchurch.org, and we'd be glad to follow up with you in a conversation there to talk about how, uh, what that decision looks like and how we can help you along that, that part of your journey. Whatever your decision, we want you to consider that today. Let's stand together and sing as we prepare to close our service in just a few moments. Let's stand together and contemplate the decision that God has put on our hearts.
Once again, what a joy to be able to share today in this time of worship, and so thankful to see everybody here. I uh, hope you are encouraged, and I hope that you and your family are, are doing well as we head into another week. Just a few things as we close here. I want to remind everybody, of course, opportunities to give. We talked about uh, opportunity to, ways to extend mercy, and one of those things is, you know, we know that, that God honors us when we take what we've been given and we try to reciprocate that to other people, when we operate out of an open hand. And so we encourage you, to, it's something we believe in as a church, and we'd like to participate in, and we'd like to participate in as far as even giving to our community from what's been given to us. And so we encourage you to participate in those ways listed there. Those of you here in the, in the room, there are boxes at the, at the end of the room here, at the end of the aisles when you exit. Uh, of course, online and through our P.O. box as well are opportunities to give. Coming up, a few things. We get, of course, we're right around the corner from Easter season. We've got a number of things happening. One of those is our Easter egg hunt, uh, Sunday, March 28th. That's at 12.45 p.m. at the Hillside property out on the west side of town. Uh, that is something that we are going to be, you know, we're excited to be able to offer. Uh, we're going to observe all the, you know, the uh, social distancing, mask wearing. We're actually going to ask as we get closer to the event for people to RSVP so that we can kind of get an idea who's going to be out there, how many will be out there to help us kind of set up and anticipate that. You'll hear more about that in Nick's notes and things in the coming uh, weeks. But uh, we also, we need uh, candy. Of course, we need candy to be able to put in eggs. I mean, no one wants to hunt for eggs that ain't got candy in them. So uh, if you would, I know a number of you have already, but if you can kind of, uh, we got a little donation bucket in the foyer out there. If you can donate some individually wrapped candy, this is sort of like, think of like, again, like, like those big bags of like fill of little Kit Kats that are individually wrapped, those types of candies, Tootsie Rolls and things. Uh, you put those and donate those in that bucket through the week or even on a Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, uh, we would be uh, grateful for that to help us with, uh, with the Easter egg hunt. Also, I want to just mention here just briefly that the part of the Easter season as well is Good Friday and the Easter uh, Sunday itself. We are going to have a Good Friday service coming up on April the 2nd, 7 p.m. It'll be an in-person experience as well. It'll be online streamed. And so we encourage you to be thinking about that as well uh, as that approaches. Uh, and uh, we'll probably have an RSVP even for that so that we can make, just kind of get an idea of, of who will be coming to the in-person experience. But it will be streamed online there on Good Friday at 7 p.m. We'll also, on Easter Sunday, we are going to move to two services. Uh, so we're going to have an 8.30 service and a 10 o'clock service. And the 10 o'clock hour will be the only one with the kids' space activities from, all, from nursery through elementary. Uh, so uh, we want to make you aware of that So, because I'll tell you what, it's great to see everybody. We, man, the faces we get to see now on Sunday mornings is great. We anticipate with a lot of Easter's, of course, that we tend to see more of that. We want to be able to make sure we have a space where everybody can be in here safely and, and exercise social distancing and all of that. So we're going to be going to two services on that Easter Sunday, 8.30 and 10 o'clock. And so we want to encourage you to take note of that. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Wayne. He's going to close us with a word of prayer. And I just want to wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful week this week. Father, we thank you for this time together. And whether we're physically here in this room or we're watching it at home, Father, we are together as the body of Christ. And Father, we thank you that we have the story of the Good Samaritan and what Christ teaches us about who our neighbors are. Father, help us to keep our eyes open as we go through the week of someone who might just need a smile and a helping hand and help us to do what we can to show the love of Christ. We love you, Father. We thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated?